do things that we felt violated Geneva Conventions. And then, what, 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 you know, sort of, what sort of things are we talking about? Uh, what sort of things are we talking about? Then? Well, we were using techniques like uh, isolation, sleep deprivation, uh, inducing hypothermia, uh, using military working dogs. Uh, we used uh, strobe lights and uh, um, loud music for sensory overload. These things are all uh, violations of Geneva Conventions for enemy prisoners of war. But when they had the congressional hearings uh, after the, the scandal of Abu Ghraib, Donald Rumsfeld said that. Um, we were following Geneva Conventions uh, in Iraq, which clearly wasn't true, and that meant to us interrogators that we were being sort of set up. You obviously had some sort of crisis of conscience at some stage. What provoked that? Uh, well, I, I, we, we, we were having um, problems with this all along. We were having moral problems, but we were being told to use these techniques, and we believed they were legal because of the, the guidelines issued by the Pentagon. So, and if you're issued an, an order, and it's a, a legal order, you believe it to be a legal order, you have to follow it. Do, do but you, uh, once the scandal broke and we heard Donald Rumsfeld saying that we were following Geneva Conventions, we no longer used harsh tactics. And then when, when I returned to the United States, um, I, I, I went to the media, I also went to um, criminal investigators to report the things that I had done and, and some of the things I had seen. And I certainly saw much worse things than what I described to you. Units out there were interrogating um, uh, detainees and breaking their bones, they were burning them. Um, you know, these people had contusions and cuts. It was, uh, it was pretty awful. We have to take at face value what you're telling us, uh, Tony Langarinus. I mean, obviously, uh, you appear sincere, but we can't vouch for our viewers exactly what you're telling us. Do you, do you ever perhaps think there may be an argument, a case for some of the coercive techniques that you've described to us, sensory deprivation, sleep deprivation, for instance, the, I'm sure you're familiar with the argument, that there may be a case sometimes if you torture someone, let's not beat around the bush, if you torture someone and they give up information which subsequently goes on to save, who knows, dozens, scores, hundreds of lives, American lives, any lives at some subsequent time, then that torture was worthwhile. Is it ever worthwhile in your view? Well, I, I think morally, no. I, I think that morally we should re reject torture entirely. But if you want a practical reason not to torture, I can tell you that 90% of the people that I dealt with, at least 90% of the people that I dealt with were completely innocent of, of anything. Uh, and, you know, these but were but people that we were sure using. But how can you be sure of these, that? These... How, how can you be sure? I mean, you know, you're an interrogator, not a, not a judge. You're right, and, or, or a mind reader. I, I should correct myself. We didn't have any evidence that these people had done anything. We didn't even have, like, a, a good reason to suspect that they, that they had, had done anything or had information. But there was a belief in Iraq that everyone knew um, who the insurgents were and had information that we could use to shut down the insurgency. So it sort of justified torturing everyone and that's that's sort of what, what was happening. I mean, I'll give you an example. One of the prisoners that I, I got, uh, he was arrested at a checkpoint because he had a shovel in his trunk and a cell phone in his car and uh, they suspected that you could use the shovel to bury an IED and the cell phone to detonate it. That was the only evidence they had against this guy. That's not enough to arrest somebody and certainly not enough to to justify using the, the, uh, the harsh interrogation tactics we were using. Does, 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 it, does, aside, it, does it change anything in your mind, though, that the harsh interrogation techniques you just described would have been much harsher under Saddam Hussein's regime and the kinds of techniques you've described, horrific though they sound to many people in the civilized West, in Iraq under Saddam would have been far worse? Well, I don't think that mitigates our moral responsibility to not torture a prisoner. You know, in international law, torture is the only human right that, you, you, you know, you can never violate. Uh, even, even the right to life is not, is not inviolable. There are certain circumstances where you can put somebody to death, but international law says you should never torture people, and I think that should be a moral standard that we should hold. I don't think that we need to compare ourselves to Saddam Hussein. When we think back to those pictures... But if you want other sorry, practical sorry. reasons... To, I'm sorry? No, carry on. Make your point. Well, if... If you want other practical reasons not to torture, I think that if you're trying to shut down an insurgency, uh, it's the wrong thing to do because we, you're actually fueling the insurgency, you're fueling uh, the anger of the Iraqi people because everybody there, they were either uh, in custody themselves or they knew somebody, they had family members. This creates a lot of anger against us. Not to mention the argument that yeah. torture often produces bad intelligence. Well, you've, you've only and, got to you think know, back, haven't you, Tony Langaranis, to those pictures, of course, that we all remember that were beamed across the world of bodies being stacked up, uh, people being put through all kinds of contortions, 
for, for comic value, really, pictures being taken. The American authorities, of course, took action against those who perpetrated those uh, activities, but obviously the propaganda defeat was there. Do you think it's still as bad at Abu Ghraib, or has the act been cleaned up? Well, actually, the Abu Ghraib got cleaned up uh, almost immediately after the scandal and, and continued to get cleaner and cleaner as, uh, as that, the year that I was there went along. But um, as a result, the, the, the detainee abuse moved outward, and uh, the detaining units would start torturing people in their homes before they were brought into the prison, or they would take them to a remote location and torture them there. And often that torture was far worse than what they were doing at Abu Ghraib. Uh, well, I, I mean, Abu Ghraib was horrific, uh, but um, and it, it became it just became much more commonplace uh, throughout Iraq because they didn't they didn't believe that uh, the interrogators in the prisons were going to be able to do their jobs. We know the Iraq uh, War the, is the job uh, as torturer. Yeah, we, we know the Iraq War is hugely polarizing for the American people. Midterm elections coming up, it's going to be a key issue, and hugely polarizing even for people who've served like yourself. Uh, what do your former, your erstwhile colleagues make of what you're trying to do now? Do they, do they consider you to be a traitor to the cause almost? I'm sure that there are some people who would feel that way, but the, all of the feedback that I've gotten from people that I served with uh, has been very positive, frankly. Um, the people that I served with, uh, they, they feel the same way that I do. Tony Lagaranis, a former U.S. Army interrogator. We appreciate your time. Thank you.